name is Asmara Raksono. I'm a Jakarta-based writer, illustrator, and social media enthusiast. And I will be hosting tonight's session, challenging the idea of a heroine, lessons from the queen of chiclet, with the queen of chiclet herself, Sophie Kinsella. Yay! I'm a huge Hi. fan. You. Hello, thank How you so you? much for having me here. <laughs> this is such a joy. I can't believe yes. that we can connect so easily and have this wonderful chat. So lovely to see you. And I'm glad to see that we've both dressed in pink. I feel this exactly. is a very good start. <laughs> yes. So, so how are you, Sophie? Oh, I'm really well, thank you. I mean, it's a strange time, uh, as I think everybody understands. And um, we in the UK have just gone into a new lockdown. So that's a bit of a right. challenge. But, you know, I am someone mm -hmm. who tries always to find the bright side and the positives and just think, well, let's get through it in the best way that we can. And I'm just that so thankful for things like technology that means that we can still connect with our loved ones and our friends and colleagues and new faces yeah. and friends across the world like we're doing right now. Um, and so right. find, find what can get us through and try not to dwell on the negative. <laughs> right, that's very positive of you. And I hope people will, you know, get inspirations from our chat today. So um shall we dig into the questions yeah um yeah it has been two decades since you first introduced becky bloomwood to the world through confessions of a shopaholic and since it's first written in the early 2000s what do you think makes becky's story still relevant in the 2020s well first of all i have to express my astonishment that it's 20 years because it feels like yesterday that i started writing her um, I mean, who knew that she would last for so long? I mean, I didn't even know that she would have such a widespread appeal um, right. in the first place. But I think that kind of answers the question because I think that she is actually quite a universal character who people relate mm -hmm. to, not just in terms of shopping, but in terms of outlook. And I think that the world has changed drastically since she first started, you know. Um, yeah. When I first started writing the books, everybody was shopping mad. There was a bit of a boom. Everyone was taking out lots of credit. Nobody had ever thought of a financial crash. Nobody was right. really being responsible with their shopping. You know, we were different types of people. And so she mm -hmm. was responding to that world. Um, and now so much has happened, which I've reflected in the stories, you know, we've had the financial crash, people have had to cut back, I had a whole book in which that happened, she's grown up, I think a lot of my readers have grown up, and yes. so some of the circumstances of her life have changed, but you know what, she's still the same person, so whereas mm -hmm. once upon a time she was flicking through magazines to find the latest fashion now she's on the internet and whereas once mm -hmm. upon a time she was always out at the shops carrying all her shopping bags now <laughs> she's shopping online and trying to hide her delivery boxes from her husband Luke um, so <laughs> that sounds like my problem as well. <laughs> well exactly I mean she's like all of us we've all changed right. as the world has changed and it takes humans about a nanosecond to understand what's changed and to adapt and to change our behavior. But you know what, we're still the same people underneath it all. So she right. still feels love for lovely, gorgeous items that she sees in a shop. She still gets excited by a bargain. She still <laughs> is a sucker for the latest advertising campaign. She still loves her friends. Right. She still loves her family. She still gets into terrible ridiculous situations um and that hasn't changed right. over 20 years that will always be becky right <laughs> right and you know becky blurs the line of being a heroine and anti-heroine now what do you hope the heroines of your books represent and why is that important to you do you know i love this whole idea that you have come up with for this event and for this discussion because it is exactly what I try to do when I write. I try to write characters who are real, who are flawed, who we can relate to because we have the same flaws. And really that's where I started with, with Becky. I started with my own 
response when I open my visa bill and I feel all these emotions like denial like what I didn't spend all that money are you kidding and and then the yeah. kind of rationalization I make like well I'm saving money I am saving money if I buy this coat because it is reduced I am saving money now I know that these are not logical I know that I have bad habits but I also know that I'm a human being and we're all human beings mm. and so with all the characters that I create I try to make them real I try to help them to face up to their flaws and I'm not going to say that Becky has mended all her ways because <laughs> I'm not sure she will ever mend all her ways, but she has definitely um, overcome some of her bigger problems. She's been thoughtful. She's taken advice. She's had self learning along the way. And I would say that all of my characters, I also wrote a character called Samantha, who is mm -hmm. um, a workaholic lawyer in a book called yeah. The Under goddess and so she yeah. has a different set of problems and flaws um and she too has to look at herself and think well who, right. who am i am i leading my best life and then in i owe you one my heroine is called fixie she tries yeah. to fix everything for everybody which is right. in a good quality but not if you take it too far you can't spend your whole life trying to fix everybody else's problems and so in the course of the story, she has to look at herself and draw a line right. and think, I, I'm, I'm not behaving in the most healthy way for myself. And I try to mm -hmm. have all these journeys, not like a self-help book, but like entertainment, comedy, a good story. And so my heroines develop through the story. And I hope that it does help people who might relate, who might have these issues or you know, a lot of my readers think, well, yeah. at least I'm not as bad as Becky. I think a lot of Indonesians will relate more to Fixie because we are very, very close-knit with our families and we we are sometimes burdened with the with the idea to, you know, to keep in uh, in touch with our family for such a long time. You know, it's it's uh, it's a given culture here i think yes. it's, well, I really, it's going to I really resonate that. more i yeah. really relate to that i mean family is at the heart of all my mm -hmm. books really but in i owe you one it's really key that um that fixie is trying to keep her family together she feels yeah. incredibly responsible mm -hmm. she feels great love but i think she also doesn't assert herself enough yeah especially with some quite dominant siblings and a lot mm -hmm. of readers have said you know what i really relate to this um you can be yeah. an adult you can have great qualities a career and you can assert yourself with other people and then you get back into your family yeah. with your parents with your siblings and suddenly you're a child again <laughs> that's very indonesian <laughs> oh, that, <laughs> well, I, I relate to this a lot and actually yeah I think that, for example, if you talk to people when they've been mm -hmm. home to their family for the holidays, they suddenly sound like teenagers. They're suddenly exactly. like, really unfair. And I had to sleep in this bedroom. And such and such <laughs> stole my thing. That was my thing. They stole it. You know, <laughs> we all suddenly go back to who we are. Right. And I think it can be really funny. But I also think that in I Owe You One, Fixie needs to start fixing her own life. So I hope that readers will kind of also respond to this and, and understand that loving your family doesn't mean just doing everything they ask all the time, no questions asked, mm -hmm. become a doormat and let them boss you around the whole time. It sometimes <laughs> means being a bit tough, being a bit strong, yeah. having your own opinions. And I think that's mm -hmm. been a really interesting journey in, in that book for Fixie as she finds a voice in her family. So perhaps, you know, in Indi Indonesia, this will have a, a particular resonance. Oh yes, totally. Especially in times of Corona like this, <laughs> where we're well, stuck we're in, a, in a lot the of our families, <laughs> right? We're also thinking of our families more than we expected. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you you used to you know you are still writing about twenty somethings, right? And uh, mm -hmm. what is what is the biggest challenge in the creative process in in writing about twenty somethings? 
Well, I like to write contemporary books. So I like mm. to feel that I am writing books that um, tap into the zeitgeist. So I have to be really, I think, aware of what's going on, what people are doing, what their concerns are. I mean, I love writing about 20 something characters because I feel that that is a time in your life when so much is open, so much is possible. And so you have this lovely, huge horizon. Um, and I'm not saying that people in their later decades don't have opportunities, but I think that the more baggage that you acquire as you go through life, the more you, you might, Feel it's harder to make these huge leaps. Um, I just find it a fascinating time. Also, in your 20s, you're still working out who you are. There's a lot for yeah. a storyteller to play with. Um, yeah. In terms of office life, I left office life when I was still in my mm -hmm. 20s. And so for me, I am forever the 20 something person in the office. I never went up the ranks, right. I never knew what it was like to be the big boss. I always felt like the junior and I still feel like the junior. So for me, it feels very natural to write these characters because I, I absolutely know what it's like to be the junior and I still pretty much feel like that. Um, right. And I suppose my, my biggest challenge is just sort of work out what's relevant, um, which I, I get from just being open to the world, really. That's how I write all my books is go, you know, read, listen, be aware of what are people talking about? What do we all care about? And, and try and put that into my stories. Right. Now, you wrote I Owe You One at the, at the pipe of a social media phenomenon. Now, in what ways does social media shift your way of storytelling that are visible in this new book? Well, I would say social media has been such an interesting trend because, you know, for me as a novelist, I'm writing about characters connecting. That's what interests me and all the different ways that we connect, you know, whether it's eyes meet across a crowded room in the kind of the old fashioned sense, or you send someone a text or you see them on Facebook or you tweet them. Um, right. And I think in, in I owe you one, there's quite a lot of um, playing around with sort of direct connection with your family. Um, Fixie's sister is very into Instagram. And so yep. that comes into it there. Um, <laughs> there's, there's sort of, I, I love the comedy of social media. So, you know, there's, I mean, without yeah. wanting to give too many spoilers, there's quite a sort of comedic <laughs> sequence where her sister decides to become a sort of Instagram star. I mean, who hasn't wanted to become an Instagram yeah. star basically at some time at the moment? <laughs> it, it crosses all our minds. Like, oh, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could be a social media star. Um, it, you know, <laughs> it's just sort of, it's just out there as something to, to do. Um, but I think what I'm interested in exploring, and I did this also in um, a book I wrote called My Not So Perfect Life, is to look at the difference between the image which we project and then the reality mm -hmm. which is behind it and whether those two match up. Um, for me, the benefit of social media is the connection. And I love that. I mean, I love this, you know, the fact that we can communicate like yep. this, it's amazing. And for me, what I love about Twitter or Instagram is that instant like, hi, you know, in the old days, I used to get letters from readers and they took months to arrive. And now someone can contact me instantly. It's instant, yeah. It's fantastic for that. But I think that for me, the only negative to social media is some of these issues I've explored where you have an image and the truth may not reflect that. And I think that yeah. the pandemic is actually making this even more of an issue that we're all just communicating through screens mm -hmm. and screens don't tell the whole story. You know, right. if you only see your friend through a screen, you don't know if she's hiding some kind of heartache or there are some problems mm -hmm. and people try to always present the best side and the, the mm -hmm. shiny side. And is that really who they are? So I think there's a, there's a lot of, um, there's so much more to write about social media because I think it's here. I think it's fantastic and it's fun, but it's, you know, complex. So I right. think it's going to be probably a theme that doesn't go away. So it is, it is somewhat very, uh, related to to the reality of of things, right? So because many don't realize that many chiclet uh, chiclet books serve some realistic aspects of society. Um, 
what approaches do you use to incorporate this uh, particularly in your newest work? Well, you know what? I kind of, I feel that what I'm writing is entertainment and it's comedy. Mm -hmm. I want people to laugh. I want them to escape and be entertained. But I mm -hmm. think that the best entertainment and the best comedy comes from truth. It comes from reality. And I think that the more that we can relate to our heroines, um, well, all the characters, um, and the more that we feel their troubles and their pain, the more we enjoy their story. And actually, the more we laugh, because often comedy comes out of pain, you know, disaster. Exactly. <laughs> disaster <laughs> well said. Yes, comedy. Um, and, and so I always try to find something, whether it's, um, as we've said, the, the flaws of um, my, my characters and the, the issues that they have to deal with in themselves, or mm -hmm. as you said, you know, I, I dealt a lot with the workplace and the struggles in the office, relationships between colleagues, family pressures, um, debt, workaholism yeah. i mean when i list all, all the topics that i i deal with they sound quite dark in fact whereas <laughs> I, I write very light books and i think people do take these issues on board and they you know they take what they need i mean i have had so many um letters and messages from readers mm. who have responded to the more serious elements of what i do in particular i wrote a young adult book which dealt with um, anxiety, which is a huge issue um, yeah. in the world at the moment. That was finding Audrey, and Audrey is trapped at home with social anxiety. It, but it's funny too. Um, and so I, I feel that you, you know, you can't just tell a story which is all candy floss. There has to be some real meat. Um, yeah. And so it's just instinctive in me that I have to find something true and worth talking about. You know, a subject mm -hmm. that is worth exploring. Um, mm -hmm. and will really give the reader something to think about. You know, I, what I, I always hope with my books that they might laugh, yeah. they might cry, but then they'll also <laughs> have something to think about. Right. Okay. So this pandemic, as you said, has, you know, um, have its effect on us. Um, how is the pandemic affecting you and your work? And what does the future of the book industry look like to you because of this? Well, it's really interesting. So um, I was lucky enough that I had just finished writing um, a book when the pandemic hit, because I will tell you that in the first days and weeks of the pandemic, I think I was similar to a lot of people. All I could do was look at the news. That was like right. my mm. only, that and try and find some food for my family because they all came home and there's a mm. lot of them and we had to self-isolate because of one of my children. And I was like, I seem to be back to a hunter-gatherer situation here. My main concern is right. feeding my family. So writing took a back seat. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it was quite hard to laugh in those mm -hmm. first few days and weeks. Um, since then, I think I've got a bit of perspective. I've edited a new novel. Um, I'm now planning another novel. And the big question for a lot of authors is, you know, do we write about the pandemic? Do we not write about mm -hmm. the pandemic? And for me, um, I'm, I haven't quite decided yet. I'm, I feel like I would like to write about a parallel universe in which we do not have a pandemic, because that would seem mm -hmm. to me to be a world that I would like to write about. But I think that all the themes of the pandemic are going to come into all our writing. We won't be able to help it. Um, I think there are some positives, which, you know, I'm such an optimist. Um, mm -hmm. I always try to be, you can probably tell, you know, find the, find the positive, however dire things are. And I think certainly in the yeah. UK, there's been a real sense of people coming together, people helping each other, um, people, you know, in the first few days of the pandemic, all I got was texts from friends, people that I hadn't heard from for ages, right. and all just contacted each other are you okay are you okay that was everyone's instinct was to just check in on everybody that you knew are you okay how are you doing can I help yeah um, and so I think there have been some positive um discoveries about it you mm. know I'm a storyteller and I would really like to know how this story ends quite frankly um right um, <laughs> I'm kind of 
Right, me too. I'm curious. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all a bit tired of being stuck in the middle of the story. We would like to see the yeah. ending right now. Of course. <laughs> We've got to be able to flick through the pages and think, well, there's this many pages left. So we can't do that. We feel yeah, a bit yeah. powerless. And I think that that will probably come out in what people write as well. This feeling that you're powerless, that you're no longer fully in charge of your own life. And that's quite hard to deal with. Um, mm -hmm. But what I hope that I can do is help people escape, actually, mm -hmm. is help people just smile and escape and forget about it for a little bit. Uh, my instinct is always, you know, that's that's my role. Cheer everybody up. Um, I wrote a few little funny um, pieces about Becky in lockdown, um, which I put on my Instagram page just to cheer up my readers. So yeah, that was I my saw that. <laughs> I just thought, yeah, you yeah, know yeah. what? What would Becky do? Let's just let's just spend a bit of time with Becky, forget our own lives, and help to escape. So I think that, you know, I just. I just hope that what I do will just give people a few hours off. Right. Like and thank you for that. <laughs> well, I hope so. Um, and, you know, we all just do what we can, really. Right. So um, we have uh, some reader's question. Now, the, this, one, this one is from Yulia Ariani in Indonesia. Uh, she asks, the trend of adapting books into screens is very popular currently in Indonesia. Um, how do you coordinate the script writing since you have, um, you know, your novels being brought up to the to the silver screen? Um, do you do you prefer to get involved in the script writing process, or would you rather give it give it up one hundred percent to the movie script writer? With which practice do you think is best? Um, that's a good question, um, and I would say that so far. I have handed over, but I have tried to be involved a little bit. Um, I think it's quite hard to chop your own book into a screenplay. Right. I really admire people who can. Um, and for me, I think it's been, it's been a, a better process to let the scriptwriter do what they think, because also, you know, screenwriting is real teamwork so mm -hmm. it's a kind of combination of a screenwriter a producer a director they all come up with their vision now their vision mm -hmm. may be different from my vision and i'm not right. sure i've quite got the distance to necessarily mm -hmm. go oh i see you have a completely different vision absolutely i'll go along with that i think i would be clinging on to my vision <laughs> so, right is that, is that what maybe, happened what what happened with the with the first shopaholic movie so, so what happened with the first job of Holly is that this was developed in Hollywood, away from me. I wasn't right. really happy with it. But what mm. did happen is that I got asked on the set when they were filming. And so I was able to be there, answer questions, give my own ideas about how a scene should go. I could talk to Isla Fisher about the character. I, I talked to all of the actors about the characters and sort right. of try to inject my personality and mm. my comedy um, and I was very lucky that the director was very you know keen for me to be there um, and right. he would consult me about scenes and so I felt like I had an input even though and I did actually write a few lines when they needed an extra line mm. you know, on set I would just I write see. a line you know they would say it or not say it um, right and so I felt part of that process and I felt listened to without having mm. to be the one to make all the decisions because I think screenwriting is mostly about cutting stuff out yes. um, because you oh, just yeah. cannot put the whole mm. of a book on the screen and especially with the Shopaholic film they were trying to put two books on the screen well I mean that's going to take yeah. some quite severe editing right. so I wasn't part of that mm -hmm. but I was able to inject what for me was the most important thing was like the character of the books the right. the comedy the sweetness the innocence um to get that personality across which mm -hmm. which i think i managed and similarly um they've just done a film of can you keep a secret um where somebody else wrote the screenplay but i was able mm -hmm. to 
give my notes and send emails and say, well, this is what I think. I think, you know, this line should go like this. And so it's like having a voice without necessarily taking full responsibility for the adaptation. Right. Okay. One last question. Uh, this is from Nafisa, Nafisa F in Indonesia. The name Sophie Kinsella is identical to Chicklets. Now, did you ever plan or maybe in the future to go beyond the genre? Have you ever been curious about writing something that is the polar opposite of what you currently do? I have. I have. I was oh, exciting. Thriller. And I started okay. plotting this, this quite <laughs> okay. thriller. And um, I sent it to my agent when I'd written like a couple of chapters. And they yeah. said, you know, the plot is fine, but everyone is far too nice. Um, it's not pretty <laughs> enough. <laughs> so okay. I stopped that. And I do sometimes think I'd love to write, you know, something dark. But I'll tell you something mm. funny. I was doing an event back in the days when we could do live events with people in bookshops. Remember those days? Anyway, so yeah. there I was with a whole load of readers. And somebody said a similar question. And I said, well, sometimes I wonder if I should write a book with a sad mm. ending just to challenge myself. And this woman almost screamed. No! <laughs> she was like, you can't do that. And then all her friends joined in and they all started saying, no, if you do a sad ending, we're not going to buy the book. No sad endings. <laughs> so, <laughs> Does that affect you really though? Funny. That told me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, so we will, we will see another attempt in the future on Thriller. Okay. Who knows? Um, okay. Who knows? Right. All right. So um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And it's been an honor since you are one of my personal favorite authors. And uh, thank you for being here. And thank you for being a part of this Jack Tent event. And I am so happy that we could talk across the world like this, thanks to technology. And I hope you have uh, you know you will come with new um with new books and uh we will be waiting in indonesia <laughs> for your next upcoming book thank you so much sophie you are so kind i would just like to thank you and everybody for making mm -hmm. this happen and just wave to anybody who's watching and say thank you for reading you know and i hope as i said i can just help you smile and escape and i will thank you from my heart Thank you so much and be well, stay healthy and stay safe. And you too, you too. And send, send our love to everybody in the UK. Yes, me too. Mm -hmm. See Thank you again. You. Thank you. This was fun. Thank you, Sophie. This was fun and we should do good. this more often. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Sophie. <laughs>
dalam setiap denyut kota, saya selalu menjadi saksinya. Disiarkan lebih dari 20 televisi jaringan Jopos Group. Jopos TV paling Indonesia.